as a preparation to the large projects, it is important that we understand the computing environment that we use to a better degree. We have not discussed the underlying hardware features yet. I have decided to deal with that towards the end of the course. However, the programming environment which we use, so as I said, it is important that we understand the computing environment better so that we are well prepared to deal with the large projects which we are going to execute in this course. In this brief lecture, I will very quickly recapitulate what we know so far. Then I will describe the software categories and classification. More specifically, I will describe the language compiler, the operating system and the main management functions. I will briefly discuss what libraries are and how they are handled. And then mention the notion of utilities, tools and packages that we all end up using whenever we do any programming. So here is a brief summary of what we supposedly know. We have learned that computers can be programmed using higher level languages. We specifically use C++, which appears to be an extension of language C. It's a hearsay. Also, we are aware that there are many programming languages. We are also aware that every programming language have, has specific syntax or grammar rules and instructions can be written to make the computer work provided we follow these grammar rules explicitly. If we make an error, the computer tells us that it cannot understand our instructions. Of course, our purpose is to implement some semantics or logic in our algorithms, which is what we do using correctly syntax-based instructions. Now, we are really aware that the computer cannot understand instructions given in C++ or for that matter in any higher level language. Computer, as we had very briefly mentioned at the beginning, can understand what is known as a native language, which is essentially a binary coded instruction set. The computer can execute instructions given in that machine language. Since we don't give instructions in machine language, there must exist some mechanism which will translate the instructions that we give in C++ into the machine language that the computer can understand. How do we translate higher level languages into machine language? Well, it's a tedious job. So people have written programs, just like we write C++ programs to find a square root or find the inverse of a matrix, people have written programs which will analyze the text in which we have written instructions, understand it and convert it into machine language instructions. These translating programs, which are called compilers or interpreters, will do this job. We do not know how the translators work, but we are aware that we deal with the computer through a terminal and a keyboard. So we understand that there is some software called operating system which is residing inside and that operating system interacts with us through what we call the command prompt. In our case, we usually see a dollar symbol against which we write our commands and those commands are run by the operating system. Typically, we first log into the system and then receive that command prompt from the operating system. We are also aware that we deal with a lot of files which are stored in directories. We are not yet clear as to how the data in these files. Incidentally, the program lines which you write in a program file, say proc.cpp, is nothing but data for a computer. It just keeps it in a file. You recognize it as a program file. The machine has no mechanism of knowing what is a program file, what is a data file. For it, it's a file. What we are aware of is that such files are stored on the disk in different directories. So when we log in, we automatically get into a home directory. Typically, we create files with specific extensions, such as .cpp for representing C++ program files. The compiler, by default, 
appears to generate an executable file called a dot out. So we typically say dot slash a dot out to execute our program. We are still not very clear as to what we have to say, why we have to say dot slash a dot out. Why can't we just say a dot out? However, we are aware of these generalities of the computing environment. With this limited background, we quickly examine the complete stack of the computing system that we have in front of us, starting with a little bit on hardware. We'll explain the details of this hardware towards the end of this course, as I mentioned. Right now, it is sufficient to identify a few basic elements. The first and foremost is the heart of a computer, which is the processor. A processing unit which is capable of executing instructions written in the machine language. So that is the computer's heart. Typically, this processing unit comes these days in the form of a chip. So you must have heard of Intel Xeon chip or dual core processor chips, AMD chips, etc., etc. We have seen already that the computer is capable of storing our instructions in its memory and automatically execute these instructions. So naturally, the processing unit has a memory. The memory is also used to store not only our instructions, but also data. Memory of modern computers is volatile. That means when you switch off the computer, all contents in the memory go away. And that is why the program instructions in other language like C++, all the translated program instructions in machine language, all our data, all the results produced by any program, if we want to preserve them, they have to be stored in the files on the disk. The disk is an external device that we are aware of, although there are different types of storage devices, which we shall see later. There are peripheral devices, two or three of which we see every day. One is a terminal, such as the one which is there in front of me. The other is the keyboard. In a laptop, keyboard is integrated with the terminal. And a mouse like this. So there could be printers, there could be devices like fingerprint devices that we saw, any other specialized device, all of these are called peripheral devices which are connected to the computer. Needless to say, these peripheral devices cannot at all operate on their own. So there must be specific instructions executed by the processor in order to send some information to these devices or to collect some information from these devices. Exactly the same thing happens even with disk and magnetic tape. Nothing goes in or goes out without an explicit instruction being executed. But we see that such devices are connected to the computer. We look at the very basic form of software, programs written in machine language. Software is actually a generic name given to any type of computer programs. It is called software as opposed to the hardware which can be physically seen and physically touched. This nomenclature was introduced long, long time ago and it has stopped. So consequently, instead of calling people programmers, we call them software engineers, etc. Now, the programs which are stored in files such as A dot out represent the most basic software, which is the machine language instructions. You would see that you can use GEdit, for example, an editing tool to look at or modify your C++ programs. That is because those programs are written in English-like language using normal symbols which all of us understand. If you ever try to do G-edit on an A dot five, out file, you get something very funny because there are no normal characters. What you have inside are machine instructions. The instructions written in such a language are in binary form. So consider an instruction like this. This is an hypothetical instruction. You and I cannot make out what exactly this means. Your series of 1011100101, etc., etc., etc. Typically, a machine instruction written in this part has two components. One is called the operation code and the other is called the address part. The operation code is actually a number of bits which in various combinations could make the computer execute different actions. For example, there could be a combination which will mean add, another combination which will mean subtract, 
A third combination which will mean take data from outside and put it in memory. A fourth combination which will mean load data which is there in the memory location onto the working register. You remember the Dumbo model? When Dumbo has to do any arithmetic, it actually goes, takes out data from the memory drivers, puts that data on a table and then works out the calculations and finally puts that data back. What you see on the table are a set of registers. But even to get that data out from the memory onto the register is not automatic. As a matter of fact, our Dumbo does not understand symbols like A, B, C, sum, whatever. So actually we have to give an instruction to Dumbo such as this. 10110011. This may mean, for example, hypothetically, that whatever Dumbo has calculated on the register in the table, that value should be taken and put in the memory location 01011000. Observe that this memory location address is part of this instruction. So typically the instructions will be look, looking like this, a part which is called the opcode or operation code, other part which is an instruction. And in fact, every instruction to the computer to be executed properly has to be in this form. This is a typical representation. There are instruction formats designed which have multiple addresses. So you can have an opcode, address 1, address 2. There are instructions which can involve three operands. Opcode, register 1, register 2 and destination, location. Now these depend, the formats depend upon the designer of that machine language. The person who designs the machine language actually works closely with the computer hardware. The moral of the story is every differently made computer or every differently made processor will have a different instruction set. Instructions which work on one computer will in general not work on computer of another type or another model. Now that makes life very difficult because every time you want to find out the square root of a number, you will have to write not only instructions in this stupid form, 1100, etc. You will have to write different set of instructions for different computers. Incidentally, that was the state of affairs in most of early 50s. The computers had to be programmed by hand. Suppose I wrote a program like this to do simple computations. There could be about 100 instructions. These instructions I would have written painfully on a piece of paper. I would have to insert these instructions into individual memory locations by flipping and flopping a whole lot of switches. Down is 1, up is 0, etc, etc, etc. And after these instructions go inside the computer's memory, I will make that computer execute that program. It was not uncommon to take about a day to just load the machine instructions inside the computer. And then, of course, it would execute those instructions in about 5 to 10 minutes. That 5 to 10 minutes today is typically less than half a second. But the essential ability of a computer to execute only machine instructions has not changed. So as a result, while the machine language is the most powerful ultimate tool to execute instructions or our program or to write instructions, we need something better. So this is the backdrop. In 1950s and 60s, additional mechanisms were developed, were designed, were invented, so that we could write our programs more easily. In fact, in the early 50s, it was only specialized computer programmers who could write programs of any kind. Even if you have to do numerical computation, and you are an expert in numerical computation, you had to go to a computer expert to write the program. When higher level languages were developed, it was then possible for any ordinary scientist, researcher or a person for that matter to write instructions in that higher level programming language. The development started with first designing a symbolic representation for the binary instruction set. These were called assembly languages which actually defined operational code in words and memory addresses in symbol. So for example, the sample instruction that you saw in the previous slide could be written as STOC, which means store the value which is there in your result register in location C. 
corresponding with ARB instructions such as load A, ARB, store C. What it means is that A is a symbol representing a memory location. Take the contents of A and put it in my register. Then onto the register value add the contents from location B and finally store the result back. Naturally, such instructions could not be understood by the computer's processor. So you have to translate these symbolic instructions into machine language since these instructions were almost one-to-one -one matching with the corresponding binary instructions, there was really not much translation involved. It was essentially replacing symbolic uh, operation code by the actual operation code and giving some methodical numeric values to the locations which are symbolized as ABC, etc. Consequently, the task was not really that of a translation, but more of assembling binary instructions from symbolic instructions. And that is why such languages were called assembly language and the first useful software written to handle these assembly language programs were called assemblers. So as I have said here, an assembler could read the instructions written in such symbolic form and convert these into binary form instructions. I am sorry, there is a typo here. It has become covert. It's not covert, it's convert. Now, these assemblers made life slightly simpler. You did not have to remember opcodes in binary form and you did not have to remember long binary addresses. But other than that, the complexity of writing program continued to be very difficult. Because if you were to write 1000 instructions in machine code, you still have to write 1000 instructions in assembly language. And therefore, higher level languages were developed, which could actually simplify the programming task. For example, the first programming language developed in this world called Fortran in 1955-56 permitted programmers to write C equal to A plus B. Observe that this is the most common form of writing an expression and its evaluation in even C++ or for that matter any programming line. However, now the task became more difficult. So now the job of getting machine instructions from such program instructions is more complex. The translating program does not have to merely assemble instructions by replacing symbols by binary code. But it has to understand what plus means. If it is minus, different instruction has to be generated. If it is plus, different instruction has to be generated. This expression could be a complex instruction, complex expression. Equal to symbol has to be understood. A lot of control structures have to be understood. So this is real translation. It's like Tamil into Hindi or whatever, that kind of complexity. So naturally, People wrote programs to do this translation and these were called compilers. These compilers could translate programs written in higher level languages into the machine language. And because these required more intelligent mapping from such instructions, the translating programs were often termed as compilers. So they don't just assemble instructions, they compile instructions after translating. And this is the standard process you push your source program through the compiler and out you get the target program. Actually, the target program is not exactly in the direct executable form. The A dot out file that you see is the final result of a long process. The first process of translation gives you what is known as an object code. It is more or less the same instructions, but as we shall see, there are some differences. The differences arise because of this. Every application program that we write need a lot of common support. For example, some standard computations. Observe that if I use a function square root or function to calculate absolute value or function to generate random numbers, I don't write code for that. Now the code will not fall from sky, so that means somebody else has written that code. And that code or that program can be used by everybody because it's a common infrastructure. Similarly, programs to read data from a disk file. We don't write code to actually go to the disk, read this particular sector or something. What do we do instead? We say open a file, get a line. Now these things do not happen automatically. 
these things do not get translated into machine code. Instead, functions have been written for doing these jobs. Now, these functions are programs in their own right. And all of these are called support programs. So, such separately written programs, they are usually kept in the compiled form called object file. And they constitute what we commonly know as libraries. So, a library is nothing but a set of functions which has been pre-compiled by the same compiler and kept in different pieces as object files. Naturally then, when I compile my program, my program has to be connected with this program, connected with that program and all of them have to be linked together. But observe that if each program was compiled to run from a specific location in the memory only, then all programs will require that they be loaded at this specific portion of the memory. That is not possible. Because all of these different programs have to run one after another. That is the reason why the object form is called a relocatable binary form. A relocatable binary form. In such relocatable binary form, which is called the OBJ modules or .o modules in C++, they all need to be linked together. And when they are linked together, they form a composite output. The linked totality has to be loaded into the memory for final version to execute. Here is a sample. Consider this. I have written a program and I give an instruction C++ proc.cpp. What I see usually on my terminal is that I get a dollar prompt and if I say dollar slash error out, the program gets executed. Effectively, I understand that the translated program A dot out would be loaded into the memory from the disk, which is a binary program, and will be executed. But as I explained just now, this is the final stage. This is not what happens initially. Initially, what happens is that this program is translated into a relocatable binary module. Observe that in this program, I am using a function SQRT. Naturally, SQRT code or program segment is not written here. So that is one of the standard backside program which is part of the library. In actual practice, what happens is shown here. When I compile program.cpp, an intermediate file called program.o is formed. It is called a relocatable binary module because it will usually start from a base address of zero. So all memory allocations will be related to this zero. Similarly, the square root function, which has been previously compiled and kept, would also be in a relocatable form. And there could be many such modules. In the final version or final phase of the C++ processing, what the C++ system does, it's not the compiler now, it's the linker and loader. What it does is it connects all of these programs or link all of these programs. And the linking would very roughly go like this. I might have a main program occupying memory locations from 0 to P, hypothetically. These things are not in memory. These are being linked together. If P is the last location, then the next module will be put in P plus 1 to say Q. So observe that what was 0 would become P plus 1. What was 1 here would become P plus 2. This looks simple, but if there is a memory instruction inside which addresses a memory location inside, then that memory location address will have to be relocated now to the correct address. So the linker is not a dumb thing which is just putting things together. It is also relocating the code. So relocating linker is the correct definition. Consequently, all such relocated code for square root will come here, next will come here and so on. And this entire thing will be the error of. Now, why the square root function and such other utility functions could have been written by others and they are made part of some standard libraries, the actual task of linking has to be done by someone else. In our case, it is the C++ system or the GNU GCC compiler system which does this linking also. At the end of the day, when I get the file A dot out, that file goes to the disk. So somebody still has to take that file from the disk and load it physically in the allocated memory.
So all these things have to happen at the background for us to be able to execute programs. So there are some questions. Where do all these support programs reside? Second question, who puts these in memory so that these can execute and do the assigned job? And third question, where is the output of compilers kept? Well, all of us seem to know the answer. Disk, right? Everything is on the disk. The functions are on the disk. The compiler sits on the disk so that when you say C++, actually the compiler gets loaded into the memory and it executes to read our program as data and translates it. Where does it keep the .co files? Or where does it keep the .a.out files? Back onto the disk. We are so familiar with disk that we assume that that is the only natural way of keeping things. But there was a time, in fact a long period of time, when there were no disks, when there were no magnetic tape, in fact there was no magnetic media. Media such as punch card and punch paper tapes were used to store such program. The mainframe computer that we bought in 1974 here had punch cards, but it also had magnetic tape and small disk. Another small computer which we bought, uh, called HP 2100C, a mini computer. It did not have any disk. It had paper tape readers and paper tapes. So consequently, when we typed our program, we had to prepare a paper tape on a punching machine. Now, if you just feed that paper tape, nothing will happen because the machine is incapable of understanding programs written in Fortran or BASIC which were typed on that paper tape. So first, you had to load the translator, which was an other paper tape. So you put that paper tape in, and that will take the translator inside the machine. Then you put your photon program or basic program on paper tape. And the translated program, where will it be kept? There is no desk. So it will produce a paper tape. And that paper tape will be a relocatable binary paper tape. Then you loaded large libraries, which came in two large paper tape spools. So you loaded those and then you loaded the relocatable binary and after that the internal linker will link all of these and produce an equivalent of A dot out file again on a paper tip. Then you loaded the paper tip back again. It used to typically take two and a half to three hours to compile one program. And it's not very long time ago because I have done it. We used to spend two and a half hours to compile one program. And imagine the chagrin when the program is of printing correct results, says some garbage. So back again to correcting the paper tape on which you had written your original Fortran or basic program. And again two and a half hours later, another error. You guys are very lucky not to face such music because you have these deaths. There is one thing, however, there has to be something which can load anything, whether it is from paper tape or cards or this. There is nothing happens automatically, remember. So there has to be some basic loading capability that every computer intrinsically must possess. A computer only possesses knowledge of machine instructions. It does not automatically possess any code. So when a computer is made, before it is delivered, there is a small part of memory which is non-volatile. Even if you switch off the power, the memory does not go bad or the contents do not get wiped out. Early days it used to be magnetic core memory, now you have flash memory. In this small portion, a loader program is permanently stored. You might have been more familiar with PCs. So when you start the PC, you might have seen a term called BIOS. Anybody remembers BIOS? BIOS is nothing but basic input-output system. There is nothing but a small loader. So when you switch on the machine, that small loader takes over. It doesn't know what is happening in the world. That loader has been told to load something from a specific location into the memory and hand over control to that something. As we shall see later, that something is part of the operating system. Suffice it to say at this stage that this is what happens. Currently we use media which is this. So all the support programs reside on the disk. These are put into the memory using this loader program. Not necessarily loader program, actually as we shall see, loader program puts something common inside the memory and that something common puts other things later. We shall see that in a moment. 
and the output of the compilers and linkers and everything naturally goes back to the disk. So as I said, after the advent of magnetic media, the cards and the punch paper tape were removed from the horizon and we had instead this which could store the program data and it became possible to store programs and data not only for one person but for many people. Observe the complexity which is created by the facility. Earlier if five of us were to execute our programs, each one would be carrying one's own physical card deck or one's own paper tapes. Only the common libraries will be at one place. So the management of the programs of these five people was done by each individual user physically. I used to carry my card deck, he would carry his own card deck. And if I dropped that card deck and if cards got shuffled, God bless me. Because then I will spend one day in rearranging those cards. But now since I can put it on the disk, he can put it on the disk, you can put it on the disk, suddenly in a disk there are five programs. Now I have to have some additional management. I can't permit any programmer to modify any program because that will cause confusion. Similarly, if each program is to be compiled and the compiled final version has to be kept on the disk, take our example, for example, C++. All five C++ programs will result into a file called A.out. out. If the single file was permitted with that name, then only the last fellow who compiled the program would have A.out out on the disk. All other A.out out, out will be wiped out. We can't afford that. So we suddenly require a management to manage files on the disk for different users. So these requirements came up because of these facilities. Similarly, advances in computer architecture and programming techniques permitted multiple programs to simultaneously execute in the machine. How do programs execute simultaneously? There is only one processor and the processor can execute only one instruction at a time. It does not matter whether it executes million instructions per second or whatever. So if there are five programs, how can all five programs be executed simultaneously? Any idea? Well, actually, multiple programs are never executed simultaneously. But what happens? Every program, sometime or the other during its execution, will perform an operation which will take a long time. For example, consider your program which says C in or C out. Now up to that point all instructions have been executed in a split second. But when you say C in A or C in V, then somebody has to type that value. There are several seconds during which the processor is idle. It is not doing anything. Instead of making that processor idle, if you can switch the context of that processor and say that okay, Fatak is doing input output, mean you go and run that program. So it could go and run some other program. If that program gets into some input output, it could be made to go and run third program. This way, multiple programs can be simultaneously in a state of execution, each executing up to a different point, and you could do the switching of context. So this technology developed to control program execution by switching context, and this mode was called multi-programming mode. Now this multi-program is all right as long as we submitted the programs and went away and came back to collect the results tomorrow. But then terminals developed. Each one was sitting across on a terminal. Now I could not wait if somebody is doing an I.O. and I get the program control. The moment he finishes the I.O., program control goes back to him and I stand in a limbo. What happened is if 5, 10, 20 people are there, they would expect a fair share of processor time. So a methodology was evolved which was called time slicing. So you would say that if my processor is so fast, irrespective of who is doing what, I will give 100 milliseconds to program uh, user 1, 100 milliseconds to user 2, 100 milliseconds to user 3 and so on. So each one doesn't notice the difference but all programs get executed and get pushed forward. Such a system is called a multi-user system. Consequently, we had technology by which we could do multiple programming in a computer, that is multiple programs could run, and multiple users could run. In fact, each user could run five programs simultaneously. And such multiple users could run multiple programs, everybody getting a decent reaction time. But all of that required very intelligent control at the back end. Consequently, 
the utility programs such as compilers, linkers, loaders alone were no more sufficient. What developed out of the whole imbroglio was called operating system. So an operating system is nothing but a collection, a comprehensive collection of what we call specialized programs which will only be doing management of all these operational functions of a computer. Such a collection was termed operating system or OS. What does, where does the OS reside? Obviously, OS is a collection of program. Each individual program resides on the disk. So, OS collectively must also reside on the disk. Except that it resides on a different place. And you and I as ordinary users cannot delete files in operating system or our files, etc. It remains in some protected zone. Who loads the operating system in memory for it to start functioning? This is called the bootloader. The word boot comes from bootstrapping. The old British terminology where you have straps which hold up your trousers. So you pull the straps up and because of the elasticity in the straps, you are pulled up later. Effectively what it means in computer lingo is that that small loader that we discussed or basic input-output system that we discussed, that resides on the computer all right. When you start the computer, when you say boot, the entire operating system does not get into the computer. But a small code management part gets into the computer. And that management part knows where is the compiler, where is the thinker. That management part can understand commands given at the command prompt by the end users. And to execute that command, whatever else is required, that person is able to load them that type of routine. For example, at dollar prompt, when you say C++, at that time, that small portion of the operating system will recognize, ah, I have to get the C++ compiler, which is somewhere in the list. I will locate it, load it. So now it's not the bootloader which is loading C++ compiler, but it's part of my operating system which is doing that. Operating system therefore became a very comprehensive management tool. The main portion of the installed operating system is the only thing that gets loaded when I start my machine. All these components which are described are called system software as opposed to the application software which we write. Note that none of these solve any real life problem. They don't compute, they don't plot graphics, they don't calculate analytics, they don't, they don't do anything that is useful for solving real life problems. But without these utilities, we cannot write programs in the modern day. Therefore, system software is fundamentally required to do any good application software. The operating system manages this, which is the file system, user access control. It manages the memory by allocating different memory to different programs. It manages the processor time by allocating time slices to different users, as I said. These are some of the names, Unix, Linux, MS Windows, HPUX, Solaris, ZOS, etc. Et now, apart from these application packages, there are several backend packages. Database packages, which some of you will learn later, which are called database management systems, names are DB2, Oracle, MySQL, whatever. There are program development and testing tools, typically. Okay, I will, on the website, I will provide links to CVS, to some other utilities like EZ Graphics and other packages. I would request you to start reading the material from those links because some of those things will be used in your project. These are additional things that are mentioned here. I will not go into the details because we are losing time. Just wanted to show last few slides as part of the announcements.